Welcome to Offwatch, our weekly interview series, where this week I spoke to the winning skipper of the 2014-15 edition, Ian Walker, the first and only British skipper to lift the trophy in the race's past. If you enjoyed this interview, like and of course subscribe for many more interviews to come. Enjoy. Ian Walker's Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing won the Ocean Race in the 2014-15 edition in pretty impressive style with a leg to spare and taking the import series as well. For anybody following Ian's career, it came as no surprise. However, the double Olympic medalist did need three cracks at the whip, all a skipper, in order to take home the trophy. So, Ian, thank you very much for joining me and, and uh, talking to me tonight. And I guess that's kind of where I want to start, really, for a lot of people, um, the main question is, why do the race? We can all understand the draw of it, but why as skipper? Why begin with the pressure and the, the potential for all the finger pointing? Why did you want to kick off with that role? Uh, hi, Niall. Uh, yeah, thanks for letting me join you tonight. Um, but you're starting with the easy questions. I can, uh, <laughs> I can see straight away. I mean, uh, the honest answer to the question is I didn't mean to. Uh, I didn't even mean to do the race, actually. Um, I was sailing TP52s with an Irish owner called Eamon Keneally, um, and my good friend Jamie Vogue uh, and I were, were built the boat and were running the project for him. And uh, Volvo were looking for stopovers, and Ireland was booming at the time. And so we came up with this idea to try and uh, persuade the Irish government to bid to bring the race to Ireland, Galway. Uh, had no intention at all of sailing in the race myself. I had been a big fan of the race, but I always assumed it was for big, hairy, bearded, roughy tufty offshore sailors and not for a Namby Pamby 470 TP52 sailor. So, um, so yeah, we, we, we managed to get some money from the government and persuaded Volvo to bring the race to Ireland. And then we set about raising the money for the team. And uh, it was about then that the economic uh, crisis hit and we couldn't raise the money. I remember trying to persuade Nico to skipper the team at one point. A bit like all the top skippers, their first question is, what's the budget? We were like, well, we're kind of working on that right now. Um, and in the end, I phoned up Jamie one day and I said, look, we're never going to get a team together unless, unless someone sticks their colours to the mast and says, I'm doing it, will you come and join me? And, and, and so I decided there and then to do it. So I, I was almost a skipper before I was, I, I probably would never have been a crew member it, I was a skipper in order to make the project happen, which isn't that unusual, actually. There's plenty of examples in the past where there's, the skippers have been the one to raise the money and then taken on that role. What a bizarre way into the race then. So for Green Dragon, for you, 2008-9, you... You know, you 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 know to stretch what you've said. You almost don't want to be there. Certainly, you know, you you didn't envisage it. How quickly did you find yourself in that role, um, thinking, yeah, this I, I I can do this. Well, I mean, I, I, the answer is I couldn't have done that without very good people around me. So hiring the likes of Neil McDonald, um, uh, Justin Slattery, Damien Foxall, Ian Moore. You know, and, and persuading those guys to follow me, and 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 in some of those instances, certainly Damon and Justin do it for their country, and leaning on the whole Irish element, and um, you know that that was critical. And uh, you know, I still remember some of our first offshore sales when we did our two thousand mile passage. You know, I I hardly spent more than I think the longest I'd ever been at sea was the Fastnet race, uh, and even then I'd only done that once or twice. So, I, you know, I really hadn't sailed much offshore at all. Um, so, you know, I, and I wasn't trying to pretend I was the skipper and therefore I was the best sailor on the way or anything like that. My, my job was to try and get the boat on the start line, get the guys together, make sure everybody knew, you know, what we were aiming to do, what we were working on and, and then rely on their skills. And, and, and I was kind of learning as I went along. I, I was pretty scared still when, when we left on leg one, I, I had no idea what I was going into. And, and likewise, I mean, we actually had a very good first leg. We led to the doldrums. We led to. Fernando de Noronha. I was going to say more by luck than judgment, but that, that wouldn't be fair. We made we made a couple of very good tactical moves uh, in a slower boat, and we were helped by Ericsson, who had to stop in uh, the Cape Verde Islands. But I think it was Tony Mutter had a uh, an infected knee. Mm. I think they pulled in. They, I think they took most of the fleet with them, and we were brave enough to just carry on doing our thing. 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, I look back, uh, and ironically, my fondest memories or my strongest memories are very much of that race. I mean, for sure, winning was great fun. The middle race was really hard yards because we carried the burden of expectation. But Green Dragon, it, it was an adventure. It was old school, you know. We, you know, we had huge parties in the stopovers. We always adopted a pub when we got there. Uh, we sailed hard. We played hard. We broke our boom. We broke the force day. We blooming nearly sunk the boat going up the South China Sea. We had 43 days at sea. We ran out of food. You know, the, I mean, there was plenty of lows and there were some amazing highs, but the whole thing was a non-stop adventure. Is that what then convinced you to come back? Because if you entered into the skippership of Green Dragon, maybe not reluctantly, but certainly unexpectedly, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing, I mean, you compare the two, you know, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing feels like a very different campaign. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the reason I came back is, well, I'm a competitive little sod and I, I didn't like losing. And and I actually thought we did a lot of the race really, really well. We just had a really slow boat because we did that stage of the campaign very poorly. We, had, we were very underfunded. We were very late. We built the boat on a shoestring in China. All the excuses in the world, but they were also the truth. Um, and so I guess I wanted to prove that with the right backing and with the right time, then you know, the result would be very, very different. Uh, not to mention, of course, as a professional sailor, and, 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 and I had that experience with Jamie and, and, uh, and Phil, our other business partner, of putting a program together, and we wanted to do it again, and we wanted to do it better, and we wanted to do it right. I, I want to get to the 2014-15 edition, and there's one thing that I want to ask you about, namely the one design. But before I get there... Um, so Green Dragon, and then the first time you did Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing was in the VO 70s. And for fans of the race, I mean, I was at university at the time and the VO 70s were, I mean, you know, they just, they looked incredible. They, they sailed amazingly. The speeds and the mileage that you guys were getting out of them was so impressive. But they also, they were built right on the limit. I mean, the, the, the boats broke. And I mean, I remember in that, in the first campaign that you did with Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing, obviously on leg one, you had some pretty major breakages that, you know, uh, well, I mean, pretty tough to deal with. You know, what was it like sailing those 70s and dealing with the fact that, as everybody in the fleet must have known, they have their limits and we're pretty close to them? Yeah, I mean, that's that's right. The, um, <clears throat> the, the, the sort of structural limitations allowed you to push the design so hard that for sure you'd break the boat. So a key skill of the Volvo 70s was sailing it in a way that um, you would break the boat. Um, and that took skill. Uh, and and it was slightly, um, one of the things that was quite challenging is that um, sometimes the more you tried to stiffen things up, actually the more likely it was to break. I mean, Avian Amro uh, 2 or uh, 1 as they were called, but the second boat was a, was a great example of that. It was actually, from all from everything I've heard, really quite wobbly down below, and everybody it was kind of like everything was giving, so nothing was breaking. Uh, but yeah, I mean, pretty much every boat broke at some point. Um, but the sad thing was that I think we were through that. A lot of that uh, could have been prevented with a better uh, with the tightening of the rule and the lessons learned. So number and positions of bulkheads, the the composite materials used for below the waterline. I mean, a lot of the damage was to impact below the waterline, particularly when you were using, um, you know, Nomex instead of foam. And so the real shame was actually the last race, there wasn't, there wasn't anywhere near the amount of damage. Um, and I think we could have controlled it with one more generation, particularly if we'd just, you know, invested a little bit uh, of um, the weight uh, in, in trying to make the boat safer rather than faster. You would never have noticed it in the speed. Uh, if they were all the same. So it was a real shame. They were awesome boats. They were had to be really, really respected. Um, and, and the Volvo 65s, by comparison, you know, they don't have the horsepower and, and you could, you know, pretty much drive it like you stole it most of the time <laughs> in the knowledge it, it wouldn't snap in half. I, I mean, you talk about snapping in half. I think um, there's two major images that I remember from your time in, in the ocean race. And one of them, sadly, is you... Um, sitting on your boat 
among the sails on the deck, which shouldn't be there. They should be aloft. And, you know, the helicopter sort of peering in as you guys are coming back in on leg one with, with a broken mast. And the other one, or the other moment at least, that really stood out for me, which is an incredible piece of seamanship, is, um, um, make sure I get this right, but I think it's Justin Slattery over the side of the boat drilling holes while you guys are canted over in the Southern Ocean in order to clamp down your your skin. I mean, you talked about the Nomex core and all the rest of it. I mean, this was some pretty impressive um, roadside assistance that you were giving the boat. Yeah, I mean, they're the, they're the two big headline things. And I mean, the, the mast, you know, the mast was, I mean, you know, I was gutted, you know, put, to put the whole thing in context, we'd won the fast now, we'd broken the record. Although I think we all knew we had a speed problem reaching. But we masked it with some very good tactics and strategy and a good sail choice. But it was pretty clear, even in the short fast net race, that Group Armour were very, very fast reaching. And in fact, it only took 30 miles of the first race when the race actually started for everybody else to realize that the Group Armour were probably going to win the race. Uh, and, and, you know, so, so we'd, we, we were on a high. We'd won the import race by miles in very light winds, which our boat was very quick in. Um, and then, yeah, first night we were we weren't even outside land, and we broke the mast. And uh, you know that happened because we had you know solid composite carbon rigging. It was brand new technology. We had trialed it for six months without any problems, uh, but it broke on the first night. And um, we were pushing the technology very hard because in the first race with Green Dragon, we'd done the complete opposite, and we'd been really conservatively overbuilt everything, and we were slow. So one thing we didn't want to be was slow. So we were very aggressive, and in in that case, we were we pushed too hard in the wrong area and paid the price by breaking the mast, and and that set us back for, for legs and legs and legs trying to trying to recover, build new rigging, not you know always being scared that the mast was going to fall down, um, and that always being on your mind. And then the second one, the delamination of the hull in the Southern Ocean, that came about as a well, I mean it came about because we we'd already pulled the J4 bulkhead out of the boat leaving Auckland turned around, started a day behind everybody else. The boat builders did a great job of putting the bow back in. We set off, but that day was enough to miss a weather window, and we were now a 1,000 miles behind everybody else. Um, and we were stupid, really. We pushed too hard and uh, flew off a wave and, and, and cracked the bottom of the boat and delaminated the hull, and we didn't need to do that. We could have just been cruising. We were never going to catch anybody. And ironically, pretty much everybody else broke down, and had we just throttled back and cruised around um you know that's not that easy to do um it's easy to sort of talk in that manner but the, the, it's, you, you know you're either on the wave or you're not on the wave and sometimes even when you're backing off in a volvo 70 you can find yourself doing 30 knots yeah i mean i i that's a really interesting point and i think it's a problem just going off topic i think it's an interesting one that's going to come up in the next edition for the for the Amokas, I'm everyone's really talking about how those things are gonna how on earth do you apply the brake on those things when they get down south. Um, I mean, the the thing about the breakages is, as you said, everybody else had these major problems, rudders coming off, water coming into the boat. There was a lot of things. I mean, you, you highlighted it when you said about, you know, under the water collisions and stuff like that. So much footage of boats opening up that forward bulkhead and being covered in water, sort of, you know, washing out. Um, so with the breakages being um, something that featured for the 70s, certainly it is a little bit of a lasting image with the speed as well. With the 65s coming in, one design, you're all going to get the same thing. If it breaks, fine, but you're all going to have the red line of safety set at the same point. Um, was it something that you were advocating for did you relish the idea of going yeah let's just make it about the sailors less so about the design well i think there's yeah i mean there's two things there one was one was the advent of one design and secondly what that one one design should look like um i, I was i felt at the time without controlling the cost there probably wouldn't be another race um and once you've made the decision to go one design um you know, it. I think that that is what enabled that next race to happen, um, because when it's not one design, 
it's an arms race. There's not really a middle ground. Um, unfortunately, the one design was also still quite expensive because um, because Volvo quite rightly put so much effort into making sure it was truly one design, which put the costs up. Um, but on the other hand, the fact that those costs were amortized over two races makes a huge difference. Um, the, 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 the shame with hindsight was that the boats they created were kind of instantly outdated and not particularly good for sailing outside of the Volvo race. They were fine as a fleet, um, but unlike the Volvo 70, where you could still go and enter the Sydney Hobart race and win or race it in the Caribbean 600 or do the transatlantic, and we've seen that. We've seen some of the old Volvo 70s are picking up prizes all over, especially if you turbocharge them. It, it, kind, of, it kind of meant that it was harder to use the boats outside of the race. So it was a, it was a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, and uh, I think, you know, I was in favor of the one design. The problem with the one design is it, it it dates the boats and it dates the race and it's okay for one maybe two editions but but you can't keep the boats any longer than that. It's interesting you say that because I remember that 2014-15 edition, the one you won, the first one with the 65s, and the boats didn't particularly turn heads. They did well. They got round. There was, I mean, Dongfeng race team had a problem with their rig. Apart from that, it was pretty good on the reliability front and the race could continue. And then on the last edition, the breeze arrived right there on that first leg. And I think the boats have done a good job of kind of um, proving what they can do. One of the things that I've always wanted to ask you about that switch to one design and you specifically, because the 2014-15 was my first involvement with the race. And I remember the very first press conference that I sat down with. And because everything had gone one design, there was so much more focus on you, uh, uh, you your, your team, what you were doing as sailors, less so what you would, you know, what sail package you had or whatever. And there was a conversation about watch systems and all of the skippers went down and they said, oh, we're going to do two hours on, we're going to do four hours on. We're going to do whatever. I'm out of the watch system. They kind of laid it bare. And you said, we've spent so much time on our watch system, working it out precisely. We've really obsessed about these things. I'm not going to tell you. And I've always wanted to ask you, was that just messing with the other skippers' minds? Or was that the level of obsession that you were bringing to the game? It was probably a bit of gamesmanship, but... Um... <laughs> I mean, it is true that we did spend a lot of time working on it. It's also true that we changed it during the race. Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, fun. I, 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 there's a big decision to make whether the skipper goes in the watch system or not. In the previous race, I'd been out of the watch system, and I found that really hard. I mean, in, in a way, it's nice because you don't have to go up and get freezing cold and get water chucked at you for four hours uh, nonstop. You kind of go up when you need it. Um, but actually it just creates this no man's land where you don't really belong on deck because they have to be able to do without you and you're not necessarily needed down below. And I didn't like that. And actually it's much better knowing where the boundaries are. It meant I could spend much more time on the wheel um, and we could build the system around the knowledge that Sci-Fi and I, we'd be in charge of navigating opposite each other on, on the different watches. Uh, we'd wake each other up if, if ever we weren't sure or we needed assistance on a decision. But fundamentally, we trusted each other. And then we had, you know, we always had four people on deck driving the boat as hard as possible. Uh, and the temptation, I think, is to do the opposite, take the skipper out, maybe run the boat with three and people jumping up and down. But look, it's, you know, it's, uh, it was probably more gamesmanship than anything. I, I think looking back on that race, like most races, you know, the real key is who's on the water first, who's done the most training. And, you know, in Green Dragon, we were last out of the blocks. We had the lowest budget and we got what we deserved, really. If anything, we overperformed, really, from our resources. The next race, we were actually quite late out of the blocks, but we had a very good budget. Uh, but it turned out that if you didn't have a Huang K boat, you weren't competitive. And we didn't have a Huang K boat. So, and there was three or four teams that had one. So, therefore, we were never going we to break into those teams unless the conditions really suited us, which is generally very, very light winds. Well... On average, you don't get less than five knots sailing around the world. So, so that was really that was a really tough race with a lot of expectation. Um, but the last race was the complete opposite. We we were always doing uh, two races as long as we retained our jobs with Abu Dhabi, which 
which I'm pleased to say we did. I was a bit concerned about it at one point. Um, but they'd always said they were going to do two races. We were able to, to keep the, the, you know, the guts of the team together. We were the first boat training. And actually, we weren't the first boat training, but we, we were the first boat organizing what we were going to do. In fact, I think we were the fifth boat uh, to be built. Um, and there was a number of things in the training, key points that we learned, one of which was the use, for instance, of the outrigger for the jib, mm. which were like light bulb moments where we thought, if we hadn't already been sailing for three months, we wouldn't know that. And we knew that the teams that were later than us wouldn't know that. Um, and we masked what we knew for a period in the race so it didn't become too obvious. Uh, so I think, you know, we, we had an advantage through having trained uh, more and got every, everything from the preparation of food, the watch system, how we set the sails up. Uh, and I think it was similar in the last race. You know, Dong Fong and Mac Frey trained together. I think they were, they were leagues ahead at the start of the race and everybody else was playing catch up. And in fact, the interesting thing was that the likes of Brunel actually did catch them up and, and arguably, you know, in the last half of the race, passed them, but it was too late. So there's a lot of very similar analogies across the races. Uh, I want to take a quick pause there with the Ocean Race and I want to ask you a question about the America's Cup because this kind of feeds in to the, the, the topic I want to get onto next. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, GBR Challenge, um, obviously Great Britain has got a big history with the America's Cup, very little of it successful. Um, and we've sort of had this kind of love-hate relationship. And I think there was about a 15-year hiatus between anybody having the guts and the means and the wills to challenge for the cup. And then you guys came along with GBR Challenge to sort of go for it. And I, I, I want to ask you something specific about one of your boats. And, and you can sort of like tell me I'm, I'm, I'm on to a, to a losing idea here. But before I do that... A, you know, first British skipper to lift the Ocean Race Trophy. That's got to count for something. You've got two Olympic medals yourself. You've coached uh, Shirley Robinson for her gold medal in 2004, I think it was, in the Yingling. You know, you, you, you're a big part, not least now, working for the Royal Yachting Association in charge of the racing development. You're a big part of British sailing. When you go up to the America's Cup with all its history, with the flag on your back, personally, what was that like in terms of pride? Well, I mean, it, it's so long ago I can hardly remember, but um, I mean, you've got to put yourself in my shoes. I was 30 years old. I was asked to skip at the America's Cup and, you know, because I'd sailed a starboat and won a medal at the Olympics and, 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 and done the Admiral's Cup. I you know it's right time, right place. Um, and, you know, we made a lot of similar mistakes, actually, ironically, to Green Dragon. You know, we had a really good sailing team. We had good boat handling and all the stuff that we kind of knew we did really well, but we weren't fast enough. And, and ultimately, like most sailing races, you've got to be fast. Um, and so, you know, the thing with the America's Cup back then is we, you know, you, we had to live with it. And I had to carry that burden as it kind of all unfolded. Um, with hindsight, again, we probably got what we deserved. We were fifth or sixth out of whatever it was, nine or ten teams. Uh, I always joke that uh, we won more races than Ben did in Bermuda, but I don't even know if that's true, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I mean, the reality is it's it's really, it's it's a challenging environment. And if you're not fast, then it doesn't matter how good you are uh, and how good your team is. And we didn't emphasize enough on boat speed. We were all so late. Um, and there was lots of decisions that were certainly out of my hands. Um, but what an experience, 30 years old, skippering an America's Cup. Uh, with a lot of my mates, uh, employing a lot of my mates in New Zealand. I mean, ironically, Ben uh, Ben Ainsley's team's just flown down to New Zealand today, and it's it's like a general. I've got a friend who's going out, who goes out with one of the sailors, and I'm like, you're about to go and experience everything we did in 2002, and you know, it's great. And you know, fingers crossed they can win it because you know that would be such a boost to uh, to sailing in the UK. And of course, you know, with you guys with GBR Challenge as well, you you know, there's a couple of names on the roster there. In terms of young sailors, I mean, like you say, you know, you were 30 at the time, but young, young sailors, 20 year olds that are getting involved in a very, you know, for the experience kind of thing with GBR Challenge, who are now sailing with Ineos and all the rest of it, um, uh, 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 Freddie Carr, people like that, you know, that kind of, you know, did some sailing with you, which, which I'm, I'm sure it's nice to be sort of part of that ladder. But the main question that I wanted to ask, and this is just a pure fanboy question. This is. I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you. 
before you ask the question, I'll tell you a story about some of the youngsters on the DDR <laughs> Challenge. And, and, and you're right, there was actually quite a legacy that came out of that. And we, we really wanted to create that legacy. And we were able to do that because we trained in the UK with two old Japanese boats. And, you know, it's the likes of, uh, you know, David Carr, as you say, but it was, um, you know, Nick Hutton, who's, who's on Ben's boat currently. Paul Campbell James was another one. Uh, and interestingly, sci-fi. So sci-fi was about, Simon Fisher was about 20, he was about 21 years old or something. And he came along for a trial and we put him on the end of a jib sheet on America's Cup boat. I don't know if you've ever got near the winch of a jib sheet on, a, on, a, on an America's Cup, the old style America's Cup boat. It's terrifying. I never went near it if I could have possibly avoid it. Uh, and we did a trial and we said, look, we're going to pick five or six people to keep with us and we'll take them to New Zealand for the experience. And, and they were doing a lot of very menial jobs, but also just filling in when we needed, needed cover. And sci-fi didn't make the trials. I think he missed it by one or two. Not surprisingly, as we put a guy who doesn't normally trim the jib on the end of an America's Cup jib sheet. And sci-fi wrote to me and he said, you know, dear Ian, uh, you know, came to the trials, really disappointed on to me. I just want, I'll do anything to be involved. I don't, I, I don't want to be paid. I don't want expenses. I don't care if I sweep the yard. I just want to get involved. And at the time, I'm thinking, oh, half my eyes on the budget. I think, oh, this is pretty good. I'm going to get some free help here. He seemed like a really good lad. He only just missed out. Maybe we can look at him. And so I said, okay, well, look, we'll take you. Come and do a month with us, and we're not going to pay you. And we'll see how it works out. Well, Sci-Fi came, and he worked so hard um, that he ended up not only staying with the team. I felt so bad not paying him. I started paying him after about a month. Um, and he ended up actually crewing on a race in the America's Cup because we had two injuries and I think somebody else was, his wife was having a baby and couldn't sail. He ended up, I think, sailing the first race of the America's Cup. Actually. And if I think I'm right in saying he's the only member of the team that didn't lose a race, because I think every day he sailed with us, we won. Um, so the, you know, you know Sci-Fi is now one of the most famous Volvo Ocean race navigators. Uh, you know, he's won the race and, and, and everything that came with it. You know, he, 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 he sort of got that chance through GBR Challenge and, and it was all because of his attitude. Wow, that's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm trying to find a, a, a bit of time that he has and I have that sort of match up and I can kind of talk with him and I will ask him about that because, um, yeah, that's, that's great for him and he's done really well with that. But that must be really cool for you as well to sort of go oh, a little you know there's a little bit of that opportunity that you know people like yourself gave him and he's kind of run with it that's um that's pretty that, that you know that must be rewarding for you to look at he, he he made it all himself it was all his own doing and that's that's the moral of the story I, I you see it a lot in the america's cup and you've seen it before in the ocean race back when it was you know much more of an open design was this thing of um, we've got to potentially try something radical with a with a small R. We've got to try something um, on one side to try and get the edge over competitors. Most notably, you take a look at the um, New Zealand entry for the America's Cup when they were all on you know cycling pedestals as a way to sort of power the hydraulics, and that was a decision that had to be taken early on. And if it didn't work out, you were already down that avenue. When you came into the 2014-15 edition, with that whole, you don't have to specialise in one thing on the design. You don't have to steer yourself into a corner. You don't have to go down a particular theory and a, and a way to kind of outmaneuver your competitors. It's just going to come down to the to the sailing. Yes, budget. Yes, all those things as well. But I'm I'm curious as to what it felt like on that start line when you just, you looked at your competitors and you thought, well, we all have the same machine. Maybe I know mine better than yours. Maybe you know yours better than mine, but they're all the same. This is gonna come down to the sailors and how we sail. Did that feel fundamentally different, that challenge? Yeah, I mean, at least, at least you don't have that sort of fear in your stomach that, you know, that if you've got a lemon, you've got to put up with it for nine months sailing around <laughs> the world. I mean. Um, and, and really we're in the territory of marginal gains. Um, we put a lot of effort, like I say, into things like watch systems, sail changes, um, making sure we were really clear on our, on our, on our sail crossovers, you know, diet was a really big thing. One of our goals was to make sure that we didn't lose any weight. 
over the course of the whole race. And so previous races, we'd lost, you know, sometimes an average of seven kilos over the course of the race per person. And um, and in this race, I think we lost like half a kilo. Uh, and I vividly remember in previous races, we couldn't get the spinnaker to the top of the mask in first gear by the end of the race when we could at the start. So, you know, that was another one. We were really obsessive about looking after ourselves. We didn't think at the time that the sails would necessarily get around the world uh, without significant damage. And therefore, how well you looked after your sails would really impact on performance to the end of the race. I think we were really strong on that, although ironically, we didn't reap the rewards because we kind of already won the race before we got to the point where it was going to be a determining factor. So, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, what was also really interesting to me is, is although we did all that and we all sailed around the world, none of, we weren't on to the things that made the biggest difference with the same boats in the next race. And I think you know, whether it was by accident or skill or whatever happened, but the whole business of not using the full can to the keel, um, you know, really came out in the, in the preparation for the next race. And there was boats that understood that boats that didn't and it was only once from my understanding because i wasn't there but from what i hear it you know it took some of the boats a long time um with the with the benefit of, of volvo sharing the data that they were really able to catch up with the uh, top teams now it's a there's a controversial thing that you just mentioned there because i did speak to charles cordrelia a couple of weeks ago um about the last edition and how he won it and he did speak through, shall we say, gritted teeth about how, what he considered to be, and I think quite rightly, his secret, or at least his team had worked it out first about not using the full count of the keel. And then some very clever, nerdy people in the ocean race had gone, oh, this is fascinating. We'll let the fans know. And the sort of secret was blown. So uh, if anybody wants to choose sides on that, you can watch the interview with Charles Cordrello and you, and you can decide. Um, but it was, I mean... There's one other common denominator between our campaign and Dong Fong. Um, and, and I would always credit him with a lot of our success. And I think it's irrefutable that he was responsible for a large part, certainly at the end of the race, of Dong Fong's success. And that's Marcel Van Triest. Uh, because, you know, I think one of the key decisions we made was to hire Neil McDonnell and Marcel Van Triest to to be the team coach and to be the onshore weather support uh, because he's without parallel in my view, uh, or the people I've worked with at least. And, um, and of course he was, he was central to Dong Fung's decision uh, on the final leg to go inshore on the uh, pass. I'm sure he had lots of very positive input prior to that and lots of other people involved in that decision. But um, you know, that's, that's another example of, you know, it's, it's who you surround yourself with um, and then how you how you plan and how you organise and the attention to detail that that makes the difference. He said exactly the same thing, and I wonder whether um, those of us that are fortunate enough to be in a position where we're covering the race and sort of filtering it for the wider audience, we I don't think we do justice to the people that are on the shore and the teams that you know people like yourself have built to to support you. I mean, you must. I mean, does it frustrate you to sort of go, actually, there's there's so many people here that are deserving of praise that don't always get it? Um, well, I think I think the important thing is what you do within the team. Uh, and, I, you know, we've we've always gone to great lengths to make sure that, you know, every member of the shore team is is respected like the sailing team. And it's very easy for that to break down uh, and unravel the team. So that's true in America's Cup. It's true in... Um, it's true in the Volvo Ocean Race, all the unsung heroes. So, you know, unfortunately, it's inevitable um, in, in some regards that they'll never get the same acclaim, just like I'm sure there's some amazing people behind the scenes at Manchester City or Liverpool or whatever, but it's always going to be Jurgen Klopp and the, and the centre forward who get, who get the acclaim. But you're right, it's a team, and, and that means that everybody, everybody has to uh, bring their involvement and everybody has to make sure that, you know, they... You know, if they don't feel rewarded and and um, and uh, you know appropriately thanked, then they won't feel part of the team, and you won't get the best out of them. And that's a big part of the Volvo Ocean Race is getting the best out of everybody in your team, whatever their role. Well, let me ask you then finally about that because your role at the moment now, um, head of racing for the Royal Yacht Yachting Association. I hope I got that title right because I I do work for the RYA, and I'd hate to get my my boss's name wrong. Yeah, um, you were close. What is it officially? <laughs> director of racing but there we right. go okay right I'll, I'll write it out a thousand times um so you're you're now part of 
that ladder that's taking people from, I really like this sailing game, I'm going to get into it, to however far they want to climb and whatever successes they want to sort of reach. For somebody that has been um, up at the right, at the higher echelons of the sport in so many different disciplines as well, you know, Olympic, America's Cup and uh, offshore, and as you were saying, you know, helping people like um, Simon Fisher and stuff like that with their lucky breaks. What, I mean, what do you perceive now as that sort of gulf between the amateur and the professional? I mean, from from my poor viewpoint, it seems like that that divide has never been bigger. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that's probably right. I mean, standards standards in everything are going up, right? doesn't matter whether it's football or, I mean, look at the difference in rugby, you know, 20 years ago when it was an amateur game, look at the, look at the, the, the players now relative to them and, and a kind of a similar things happen with sailing. Sailing has been effectively professionalized in the last generation. So, you know, really kicked on in the sort of 2000 America's cup, really. Um, and, you know, with that professionalism, uh, you know, the Olympics, for instance, you know, it wasn't in 92, it was an amateur event, 1992, 96 was the first time you were allowed in loud advertising. So that's, you know, that's a generation ago, really. Um, and now when everybody's doing it full time, um, you know, the amount of support behind them is, is immense. And, uh, you know, every Olympic sailor's got a team that they've got, you know, they've got physiologists, they've got uh, physiotherapists, they've got sports psychologists, somebody analyzing data, they might not, you know, for a start, they'll have a coach, but they'll probably have three coaches, somebody helping them on technical side, somebody with regatta support. You know, they need all the sponsors that sit behind that. And, you know, it's, it's an army of people. And it's, uh, it's not really sustainable, if, if, if I'm honest. Um, and, and the Volvo has gone through the same thing. You know, when I was a kid growing up watching the Volvo race in 89, you know, my crew was sailing a 470, uh, Matt Humphreys. He left me one day and said, sorry, I can't crew for you next weekend. I've decided I'm going to go and be a cook on a Volvo boat. He'd met somebody on the dock and their cook had dropped out and he went and sailed around the world as a, as a cook. And, you know, then he went on to be skipper of Dolphin and Youth in, I think it was 89, because that's where his heart was. And so that's where the, the Whitbread race, as it, as it was then, that's where it was at. There was lots of amateur entries and there was just a few really professional ones, the likes of, the likes of you know, Grant Dalton and... Um, uh, you know some of the Kiwi boats, um, and uh, the Volvo race is completely beyond recognition now in terms of the amount of professionalism. In the same way, the Olympics and the Americas have got the same. The problem is the sustainability of it because the costs go up and up and up, and that gets to a point where the value doesn't necessarily go up and up and up. And if you can't afford it, then there is no race, and there there will be no America's Cup, or there will be eventually. Uh, you know, not no Olympics, but it, it will it will fall into different different hands. It's very hard to unlearn what you've learned. It, you know, once you've learned to be more professional and to do things better, it's very hard to going back to the good old days. I mean, there are people that did the last edition of the race who I know, you know, were single suitcase between hotels. They weren't being paid. I, you know, that they have just like you were saying the story about Simon Fisher. They they sweated for that opportunity. Um, as a final question then, with your new role, with your new responsibilities about those young sailors sort of coming through and, you know, for anybody around the world that's getting into this game and listening to your stories and thinking, oh, do you know what? I want to experience that world. I want to send that email. I want to bump into that boat on the dock and I want to make that call and I want to say, hey, do you, you know, let me, let, you, let me trim your jib for an afternoon and I'll see if I can blow up your winch. Um, what should they do? Because there's so many people who I'm sure who are thinking, I'll get rejected. I'm not going to bother. But that's that's surely not the way. Well, it's. Uh, I, I think it's in many ways it's a bit harder than it used to be because we used to have events like the Admiral's Cup and, and kind of bigger keelboat fleets that you could prove yourself as you sort of transition from dinghies to keelboats. Um, you know, now I think there's... Yeah. There's one way is to go and win a gold medal, the Ben Ainsley route, if you like, or my route. Well, that's the, well, I didn't win a gold, silver in my case. Uh, so go and get yourself an Olympic medal. And even then, very often, that's not enough to get you the break. A lot of it is, is being in the right place at the right time. Uh, there is another group of people who've actually done it also through physicality. 
particularly as uh, you know in the Volvo race, needing needing powerful, strong people, um, and and same in the Americas Cup. So there's there's been a group of people that have come through, but but you've got to remember the sci-fi story. You've got to, it, it's about attitude. It's about attitude. It's about commitment. It's yes, it is about who you know, but whenever you get that chance, you've got to make people want to help you. And and I see, you know, I can think of people right now who I come across and I think, God, that was, you know, they're a good kid or they were really helpful. Or, you know, if they come to you and ask you, I'll go out of my way to try and help them and give them a break or introduce them to somebody. Uh, and in the old days, you used to turn up in Hamble and, you know, just pick up jobs in the boatyard and work on boats and you get known and then you get out a ride on a boat and you do a good job um, and, and you work your way up. And I, I, I don't know any other way to do it. Um, you, you, it's, it's really about, it's about commitment, eth work ethic, uh, and and ultimately you've got to know people, and you've got to make you've got to have a network of people who want to help you. And go and talk to them, say hello, ask those questions. Um, yeah, I agree with that. You know, if someone asks me a question, I'll generally answer it, and, yeah. and if they, you know, if they're polite, then I'll probably go out of my way to help them. Um, and there's nothing sailors like more than to tell you how good they are and how they've done things. So I always say that as well. If you you want to understand why somebody's winning in your class, go and ask them and then put a beer in there and they'll tell you how good they are and everything they've done. And then you go and copy them and beat them the next day. Oh, wait. Well, okay. I'm going to give you a little bit of a chance then because the only thing is, is I apologize for being distracted, but your background is fascinating. I can see the model Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing. There's so many trophies. There's so many pictures. Just as a final thing, a quick whistle stop tour. What have you got on your wall there? Because it looks like you've got some pretty good memories. You, you, you might think I'm showing off, but this is because my wife doesn't let me put any sailing photos or any trophies or anywhere else in the house. So I've I've basically got one toilet in my office to hang everything over 30 years. But um, I've got to try and do I got Where are we? Here we go. That's, uh, <laughs> what is that? That's loads of photos from the 96 Olympics of Johnny Merricks and I. And our Mars sponsorship just above me here. That's oh, yeah. Johnny and I on the podium. That one is... Johnny and I crossing the finish. There's a lot of John Merricks and I apologize for that. The one over here is me and Amir Dinghi in Sligo in Ireland in 1987 wow. for the World Championship. And, my, and then the one underneath is winning the 14 Worlds in, in Kingston in 1993. And actually the model, it's slightly, it's slightly ironic because I noticed the mast is broken. <laughs> Compelling, really, but I need I need to do a bit of repair on the model. Uh, but yeah, the model uh, the model was from the fourteen fifteen race. But I need to fix the mast, not for the first time on an Abu Dhabi boat. Yeah, so a little bit of a voodoo doll of your of your uh, boat there. Which, which one broke first? All right, um, Ian, I'm going to let you go. Thank you very much for everything there. It's um, fascinating to hear about not just your career, but also about about everything that you've learned and everything that the race has taught you. So thank you very much. Absolute pleasure, and um, I can't wait for the next race to start. Um, give us something to follow. A big thank you to Ian Walker for talking me through some of the major moments in his sailing career. And if you want to know a little bit more about some of the things that he mentioned, like 1K and his design of Volvo 70s that were dominating the racetrack in those editions, you can check out the interview that I did with Wan Kuyam Jang and how he talks about designing multiple boats and it not actually being something that he wanted to do. Also, he mentioned the secrets that Dongfeng race team may or may not have in their winning edition of the race. So check out Charles Cordrelia's interview where he talks about that moment that the other teams discovered what they were doing with their keel for speed. If you enjoyed this interview, like and of course subscribe to our channel. We've got many more coming up and let us know in the comments below who you want us to talk to. See you next time.